Hi guys, in this video we will be understanding the nature and distribution of volcanic events, their magnitude and frequency, and the impacts of volcanic activity. To begin with, we're going to look at the nature and distribution of volcanic events. And in the previous video, we learned about the theory of plate tectonics and about plate boundaries. And most volcanic activity occurs at plate margins through tectonic processes. So our plate margins are the borders between our plates, shown by these white lines here. However, volcanoes don't occur at all plate boundaries, only specific ones, and we're going to look at them in more detail. So our first kind are ocean ridges, and an example of a classic ocean ridge is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is this line going up in the middle of the, the Atlantic, and we're going to look at why volcanoes occur here. So at ocean ridges, we get seafloor spreading, and we learned about this in detail in the last video, but this is where plumes of magma are coming up from the mantle and causing the crust to spread apart away from each other. And this lava that is coming up from the crust, or known as magma when it's in the crust, and lava when it reaches land, is rising up and it is able to form volcanoes. Now, these volcanoes have very particular characteristics. They don't have the classic volcano shape, they have much gentler slopes. And this is because of the type of lava that the volcanoes are made of. And I mentioned earlier in the previous video that oceanic crust contains a rock called basalt, and this makes the lava basaltic and we don't need to know anything more about it rather than the name is called basaltic lava and this type of lava has a low viscosity which means it's quite runny and this means that the eruptions aren't explosive they're more frequent and gentle and that is the type of volcano we get at ocean ridges then we have our volcanoes occurring at subduction zones and as we can remember, subduction zones are where one type of crust is being subducted beneath the other, as shown in this diagram. So we have our oceanic crust, which is more denser than continental crust, being subducted beneath it. Now, I did talk about this in the previous video, but when the oceanic crust is subducted, it becomes melted again in the mantle at a point which is around here called the Benioff zone. And when this crust is melted, it turns back into magma and it's quite light and dense. So it's able to rise back up through the continental crust, as shown here, these little red dots, and it reaches the surface and forms a volcano. But these volcanoes are very different to the type of volcanoes we find at ocean ridges because they have a very different type of lava. Their lava is more viscous, which means it doesn't run as much and it's more, I guess, sticky. And this their lava is described as andesitic. And you don't really need to understand what this means. You just need to know it's called andesitic lava. And because of the stickiness of the lava, the eruptions are more explosive. And we have steeper side volcanoes, such as this one here, which is Mount St. Helens which is in North America. And this was its last eruption in 1980, just to give you an example. So yes, these volcanoes have a much steeper side and are our pretty typical volcano shape. These destructive or subduction zones, which create these steep-sided volcanoes are found around the Ring of Fire. And the Ring of Fire is the boundary that outlines the Pacific plate because this is a destructive boundary. So our ring of fire is all the way around the Pacific plate, stretching onto the other side of it over here on this side of the world. And we have a lot of tectonic activity around these areas. So we've got lots of volcanoes, lots of earthquakes happening, and it's a very tectonically active zone. So that's one thing we need to remember about the ring of fire. We also get volcanic activity at rift valleys and we might remember from the previous video 
that rift valleys are at constructive margins, the same as the oceanic ridges, but this is where they take place on the continent. So we've got continental crust spreading apart. And an example of this is in East Africa, where they have a rift valley. And here, when we get the spreading apart of the continental plates and our rift valley forming, because the rift valley is moving apart, like in this direction, the crust is actually getting thinner as it stretches apart. And this makes it easier for magma to rise up from the mantle. So as we can see on this diagram here, as we've got our plates moving apart, we have magma rising up through the crust to form volcanoes on the sides of rift valleys. An example of this is Mount Nairagongo, which is in Africa, and we're going to look at this as a case study later on. The next type of volcano we're going to look at is an exception to the rule because they are not found at plate boundaries. So, as we learnt before, all of the volcanoes we looked at before have been found around the boundaries between continental plates. But we have these things called hotspots, which are able to create volcanoes, but they are not located at plate boundaries. And this is due to radioactivity. So, we have radioactive processes going on in the core of the Earth, and this can cause really hot plumes of magma in Pacific areas and where this happens is actually in the middle of the Pacific near Hawaii. Well it is just the hotspot is beneath Hawaii. So in this diagram here we have our hotspot and it is heating the crust here and well this is the oceanic crust and the concentration of radioactive elements that we have below the crust in this one specific location is causing plumes of magma to rise up and eat into this oceanic crust above it. And this magma is then breaking through the surface and forming volcanoes. And the types of volcanoes we get here are very shallow sided and so they don't really look like the classic volcano, they're more of a round shape and these are called shield volcanoes. And these type of eruptions are not explosive at all and the lava tends to be quite runny. So we don't really get many big explosions here. But these can form chains of islands because each volcano is essentially an island. And as we know, tectonic plates are always moving, but the hotspot is staying in the same place. So as we can see on this map here, this is the main island of Hawaii, and this is where the hotspot is currently located. But previously, this island here called Kauai was sitting over the hotspot, but as the plate has moved over time, it has produced new chains of islands along this curve, just depending on where the plate is sitting on top of the hotspot at that time. So in the future, we will have the main island moving further up as the plate moves in this direction and we might get more islands forming along in the chain. But yet again, these processes are very slow and happen over thousands and millions of years. So as you might have seen from the last topic that we just looked at, the volcanic eruptions that we have on Earth vary massively in magnitude and frequency. So there is an enormous variation between the different types of volcanic eruptions. And these are measured on what is called the Volcanic Explosivity Index, or VEI for short. And this is a logarithmic scale. We don't really need to know much about this, but it's logarithmic, starting from zero to seven. And the zero on the scale is for non-explosive volcanic eruptions, and these are going to be more frequent. And the highest ranking on the scale is a seven down here, and this is huge and very large explosions, and they are actually very rare 
it is thought that the last time a seven was recorded was in 1815 in Indonesia and there is actually an eight on the scale but it's not usually recorded because these type of volcanic eruptions are even more rare and are when we get kind of super volcanoes and the last time one of these eight happened was around 73,000 years ago. So as we go up in the scale, increasing in explosivity, we are going down in frequency. And frequency means how often these types of eruptions are occurring. So now we're moving on to look at some of the impacts of volcanic activity. And impacts can be divided into primary impacts and secondary impacts. So the primary ones are the ones that happen first, and we're going to look at these first. So typically, one primary impact is lava flows, as we can see here. And this is when the magma from the mantle is coming out onto the Earth's surface, and it forms these flows of lava, which is really, really hot molten rock. And can pretty much destroy anything in its path because it is so hot. Then we have this thing called tephra over here. And tephra is just a word to describe any solid material ejected from the volcano. So this can be ash or volcanic bombs, which are kind of rocks, just small circular rocks made up of volcanic rock. Then we have volcanic gases, which can be emitted from the eruption. And this includes carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide and chlorine. And a lot of the time, these gases are very poisonous. So they have a lot of effects on people that breathe them in and can kill people through inhaling these gases. And lastly, we have our pyroclastic flow. And this is a very hot flow. It's over 800 degrees Celsius and it's made up of kind of gas and tephra, which we just looked at above. And it's just a combination of these two and it moves very, very quickly at about 700 kilometers an hour so you would not want to be in the vicinity of a volcanic eruption if pyroclastic flow was taking place because it's likely that you would not survive it. Then we have our secondary impacts and these are some of the ones which we might know a bit more about. So firstly we have flooding and this can happen in areas where our volcanoes are in glaciated landscapes which means they are nearby glaciers or have ice cover and obviously Volcanoes are very, very hot, so they're going to melt all this ice and can cause flooding. A, another secondary impact is tsunamis. So often volcanic events, they take place and are associated with earthquakes. So often when a volcano is erupting, earthquakes will happen at the same time. And when these happen under the sea, tsunamis can be formed. And these are huge waves. And when these waves crash onto land, they can cause massive disasters and damage as shown here and this was from the Japanese tsunami. This was not caused from a volcano, this was from an underwater earthquake off the coast of Japan but an earthquake from a volcano would have very similar effects to any land nearby. Then we have lahars and lahars are volcanic mud flows and we can see one in this image here. This is the mud flow coming down from the volcano and this is when melted snow and ice is combined with ash. So it's snow plus ash and it forms this mud flow and they flow at very high speeds. And these can kill people really easily. They can destroy towns and villages and they're also very hot. We also have acid rain as a secondary effect. And this is when these gases that are released, especially sulfur dioxide over here, combines with rain and forms acid rain. And acid rain can lead to the destruction or killing of plants. And it also can damage water sources. And then this as well can lead to the killing of fish. So it can deplete fish stocks and it will also pollute the water and kill plants as well so acid rain is very bad for the environment and finally we have climate change and this is to do with ash and when the ash is emitted from the volcano as we can kind of see this volcano is not producing that much ash 
but when it goes into the sky it can block solar radiation from coming into the planet and warming the planet and therefore can cause a cooling effect because these massive clouds to put it simply will stop the sun reaching the earth now obviously many humans will live in the vicinity of volcanoes therefore volcanic hazards need to be managed and this can be done through prediction and protection and it's actually very difficult to predict an eruption but we can almost kind of prepare for a volcanic eruption through predicting when it might occur and this can be done through looking at the history of the volcano so we can look at when or well, the time of previous eruptions and how frequently. There are also other methods of prediction which involve looking at the gases emitted from a volcano because the amount of gas released by a volcano might increase in the lead up to an eruption. We also might find that before an eruption the ground around the volcano might swell so that's another warning sign of to predict and also there may be changes to ground water levels and we don't need to know in detail about how like these predictive methods can be used we just need to know that we can look at it by looking at the frequency of a volcanic eruption you know monitor gases and the swelling of the ground as well as the water levels and this might give us an indication as to when the next eruption might be. The best way to manage volcanic eruptions is through protection and this is combined with our prediction here and the most effective way of protection is through being able to give prior warning. So it's very essential to develop good alert systems and usually a red alert will be given when people are in imminent danger and this will tell them that they need to evacuate the area and hopefully they will have enough time to evacuate but also another way of protecting land or cities from volcanoes is through trying to divert lava flows and this can be done by trying to direct it into man-made channels or by creating other explosions or creating a controlled explosion on the side of a volcano, this can cause the lava to spill out from the other side of the volcano and therefore kind of lessen the impact. And the responses to a volcanic event can be short-term and long-term. So for example, a short-term response would be the provision of emergency services to deal with anyone, you know, any fatalities or injury and to another short term would be providing food and water supplies and shelter whereas long term would be rebuilding kind of infrastructure such as roads electricity and buildings and also developing future methods of protection so it's easy when one volcanic event has happened to analyze the event look at how the event could have been dealt with better and then to devise methods for better protection next time hi guys i hope you enjoyed the video if you're looking for an amazing a-level geography resource join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials see you soon and together let's make a-level geography a walk in the park